Hello everyone. Today we will be examining Eastern and Central Europe during the Cold War, noting the tensions between reformers who wanted to shake up the communist system and hardliners who wished to maintain Marxist dictatorship at all costs. One state we shall not be discussing as much is the Soviet Union. We shall cover developments there in a future lecture. After the Hungarian communists were cemented in power in 1949, they set about initiating a mass purge in their country. Hundreds were executed or imprisoned as war criminals, many of them on no evidence. Many thousands more were interned. The judiciary, civil service and army were purged by state security and party orthodoxy became essential for survival. The trade unions were made into mere executants of party orders. Those who were distrusted were collected, convicted and sent to various internment camps, the most notorious of which was the camp at Resk in north-central Hungary, which functioned in great secrecy between 1950 and 1953. Between May and June 1951, about 12,700 upper and upper middle class people were driven out of their apartments in Budapest and deported to small peasant villages. In 1948, the Hungarian leader Rakosi announced the collectivization of agriculture. Peasants were forced by various pressures into state farms. This plan was succeeded by a five year plan with an emphasis on heavy industry. Huge sums were devoted to the construction of factories, many of them planned with little regard for Hungary's resources and its needs. In fact, the plan was concerned mainly with the needs of the Soviet Union, for which Hungary was to serve as a workshop. Industrial production rose steeply, but the standard of living did not, the, pro the production of consumer goods was throttled, and that of agriculture stagnated. Rakosi was under Moscow's control, all-powerful until the death of Stalin in 1953. In July that year, he was deposed in favour of Imre Nagy. Nagy promised a new course, for example, no more forcing of farmers into collective farms and closing of prison camps. He introduced some of these reforms, but in the spring of 1955, Nagy was dismissed from office and expelled from the Communist Party. Rakosi was reinstated, and he put the country back on its previous course. He was dismissed again in July 1956 in disgrace. The new leader, Rakosi's deputy, promptly announced that there would be no concessions to Nagy. On October 23rd, students in Budapest staged a great procession, which was to end with the presentation of a petition to the government. People flocked into the streets to join them. Police then fired into the crowds. The shots turned a peaceful demonstration into a revolution. The army joined the revolutionaries, and army depots and munitions factories handed out arms. Outside of Budapest, the peasants reoccupied their fields. Prisons were open, and members of the secret police fled. Nagy resumed power on October 25th, but then was driven from one concession to the next. The Soviet troops had withdrawn, and Nagy was negotiating for their complete evacuation from Hungary. On November 1st, he announced Hungary's withdrawal from the Warsaw Pact, and asked the United Nations to recognise his country as a neutral state in the Cold War. Soviet officials were uncertain whether to act. Growing pressure for intervention from China and neighbouring Romania, Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia and an increasing realisation that the United States would not risk a war over Hungary, emboldened the Soviet leadership to act. On November the 4th, Soviet forces entered Budapest and began ending the revolution. Nagy took refuge in the Yugoslav embassy. That same day, Yenos Kadar, who had defected from Nagy's government, broadcast a radio speech where he declared the Ill illegitimacy of the revolution and proclaimed the formation of a new communist government. Kadar promised that once order was restored, he would offer reforms. Most Hungarians, however, were sceptical of these promises and fighting continued for two weeks. The Hungarians suffered about 20,000 casualties, 
whilst the Soviet losses came to about 2,000. Naji was abducted and was executed in 1958. 200,000 refugees escaped Hungary to the west. A substantial portion of Hungary's young and educated class was lost to the country. The Soviets stayed in Hungary, supposedly to protect the country from imperialist aggression. Loyalty to the Soviet Union was combined with internal reforms in a system known as Goulash Communism. By the 1960s, conditions slowly changed for the better. Most of those who had been imprisoned were pardoned and released. Kadar enunciated the principle that he who is not against us is with us, which meant that ordinary people could largely go about their lives however they wished. Private enterprise was encouraged, and the new economic mechanism, or NEM, initiated in 1968, introduced the profit motive into state-directed enterprises. Contacts with the West were encouraged, and tourism developed as a significant industry. In addition to a huge influx of foreign visitors, many of them from Western Europe, an increasing number of Hungarians travelled abroad. The two decades of NEM were, however, only partially successful, and debt in Hungary grew massively. Poland received large amounts of Western land from Germany in the Second World War, but in return had to give up its eastern prov provinces to the Soviet Union. The expulsion of the German residents from the lands in the west and the loss of the Ukrainian minority in the east, as well as the Holocaust, meant that Poland was now an ethnically homogenous nation for the first time in its history. For the time being, however, only the Soviet Union recognised its borders as permanent, helping to increase the loyalty of Poles toward their traditional enemy. Even so, Poles were resistant enough to communism that Stalin described bringing communism to that country as being as difficult as putting a saddle on a cow. Memories of the Soviet betrayal in the Warsaw Uprising, as well as centuries of Russian oppression in Poland, were still fresh. The main thing keeping Polish anger towards the Soviets in check was the devastated state of their country, which had been so destroyed during the war. Whilst Poland had gained rich Silesia from Germany, as well as an extensive coastline, these new lands were far from at operational capacity, and the population transfer brought chaos and violence. The government of Poland in the post-war period was dominated by the Polish communists, who had been in po Moscow during the Second World War and were close allies of Stalin. Communists who had stayed in Poland were distrusted. The death of Stalin opened a period of struggle for secession and change that had repercussions throughout the Soviet bloc. Anti-Stalinists in Poland rose up, a violently suppressed workers' strike in Poznan in June 1956 sh shook the whole country. Władysław Gomułka, who believed in a Polish road to socialism, became a candidate for leadership of the party. Gomułka was made popular throughout Poland for supposedly standing up to the Soviet leader Khrushchev when the latter visited the country in October. In reality, the Polish leader convinced Khrushchev of his devotion to communism and of the need for reforms to strengthen communist doctrine. Important changes followed, among them a significant reduction of political terror, an end to forced collectivization, and increased contact with the West, including freer travel. Gomorka's objective, however, was to bridge the gap between the people and the party, thereby legitimizing the latter. Hence, the period of reform in Poland did not prove to be the beginning of an evolution of the communists that revisionists had hoped for. Germany had been divided into four zones in 1945, one belonging to each of the victorious allies. A section of the capital, Berlin, was also given to each of the powers. The Soviet zone, the largest of the four in land and in population, became the German Democratic Republic, or East Germany, in 1949. The Soviets were reacting to developments in the West, where France, the UK and the USA had merged their zones into the Federal Republic of Germany, or West Germany. Whereas West Germany would be run along democratic and capitalist lines, East Germany was a Marxist state 
run by the Socialist Unity Party and its boss, the loathsome Walter Albrecht. The SED regime concentrated on building a viable economy in a territory that completely lacked natural resources. The regime used its centralised control over the economy to invest heavily in the construction of basic industry at the expense of consumer goods. War reparations required that much productive capacity be diverted to the Soviet Union. Despite an impressive rate of industrial growth, the standard of living remained low, lagging far behind that of West Germany. Food was a problem as thousands of farmers fled west each year rather than give in to the pressure to merge their lands into the collective farms favoured by the communist regime. Food rationing had to be continued long after it ended in West Germany. The resulting hardship, along with the relentless ideological indoctrination and the repression, prompted thousands of East Germans to flee west every year. In 1952, East Germany sealed its borders with the West Germans, but East Germans con continued to leave through Berlin, where free movement still prevailed. Mountain anger with the regime led to the first popular uprising in the post-war Soviet bloc, when workers in East Berlin, the seat of government, went on strike to protest against increased production quotas and a freeze in wages. When the regime failed to respond, work workers took to the streets and demanded a change in government. The rebellion quickly spread and was quashed only when Soviet troops intervened, killing 21 people and wounding hundreds of others. Some 1,000 people were sentenced to prison for taking part in the uprising, which the East German government portrayed as a plot by the US. The uprising actually rescued the East German regime as it convinced the Soviets of the need to keep stability in the country. In 1954, Moscow ceased to demand reparations and proclaimed East Germany a fully sovereign state. The SED leadership loosened ideological controls on artistic and intellectual activity, increased the production of consumer goods, and relaxed pressure on farmers to enter collective farms. Within a few years, however, the government resumed its repressive measures and again shifted its economic priorities to favour the collectivisation of agriculture and investment in heavy industry at the expense of consumer goods. The flight of refugees through Berlin continued with a high, high proportion of technicians, managers and educated professionals among them. In 1961, the flow of refugees to West Germany increased dramatically, bringing the total number of East Germans who fled to some 3 million. On August 13, 1961, the East German government surprised the world by sealing off West Berlin from East Berlin, first with a barbed wire fence and later with the construction of a concrete wall straight through the middle of the city. East Germans could no longer go to the West through the tightly guarded crossing points without official permission, which was rarely granted. East Germans who sought to escape risked being shot by East German bodyguards who were under orders to kill if necessary. By imprisoning its own population, the SED regime did stabilise the economy of East Germany, which eventually became the richest in the Soviet bloc. Under Albrecht, the East German government also tightened repressive policies and curtailed civil and political rights. We shall continue the story of the two Germanies in a later lecture. The communists in Romania established a vast security network, dissolved private organisations and repressed the churches. In their place, they created mass organisations in every conceivable sphere of activity. The party adopted Stalinist economics, rigid central planning, as well as an emphasis on heavy industry at the expense of consumer goods. It undertook the forcible collectivization of agriculture. The communists, ex the communists expected Romanian artists to subordinate their creativity to party directives. Soviet accomplishments in all fields were held up as models to be emulated and a massive effort was undertaken to make Russian the second language for Romanians. This campaign, however, failed to wean the Romanians from their Western sympathies and instead intensified their traditional Russophobia. Soviet advisers were placed throughout the Romanian party and government. 
the decade of the 1960s brought a period of relaxation in Romania and defiance of the Soviet Union in international relations. Although no genuine liberalisation took place, the intrusiveness of the regime in ordinary people's lives was curtailed. The availability of consumer goods and housing improved, and healthcare, education and pensions became more generous. Scholars were permitted to broaden the scope of their research, and writers dealt with subjects that previously had been forbidden. The source of this relaxation lay in the emergence of a Romanian national communism, which was accompanied by a growing friction with the Soviet Union. Tension between the two countries culminated in a so-called Declaration of Independence by the Romanian Communist Party in 1964. Romania's leader, Nicolae Ceausescu, skillfully played on widespread anti-Soviet sentiment in order to mobilise support for the Romanian party. The reaction of Soviet leaders to Romania's independence was relatively benign. Ceausescu's challenges did not seem dangerous enough to require military intervention. Moreover, Romania's leader brought the period of reform to an end in 1971, where he demanded a return to rigid ideological orthodoxy and reasserted the leading role of the Communist Party. In the two decades of neo-Stalinism that followed, the Communist Party intensified its control of everyday people and intruded more deeply than ever before in the daily lives of its citizens. Bulgaria's leader, Chernikov, was known as Little Stalin for his adherence to policies aimed at developing Bulgaria along Soviet lines. These included rapid industrialization and forced collectivization, heavy reliance on the police, and isolation from countries outside the Soviet bloc. In 1954, he was succeeded at his post by Todor Zhukov. The government released several thousand political prisoners and moderated its economic policies in favour of raising living standards. There was some relaxation of censorship. These developments, however, did not put an end to repression, and concentration camps did not close until the early 1970s. Under Zhivkov, Bulgaria gained the highest priority to, gave the highest priority to scientific and technological advancement and the development of trade skills appropriate to an industrial state. In Czechoslovakia, the economy was subject to nationalisation and all agricultural land became state or collective farms. Meanwhile, the communists began purging the armed forces of officers suspected of being pro-Western. Another target was religion, church dignitaries were interned, monasteries and religious orders were dissolved, and a state office for the church was set up. In a series of purges in 1950, non-communists were charged with various anti-state activities. In 1952, 12 party officials, mostly Jewish, were sentenced to death in a show trial considered to be the climax of communist purges in Eastern Europe. By the early 1960s, Czechoslovakia faced acute economic problems. The communist industrial and agricultural plans had failed to bolster the economy, production began to fall, and collectivised agriculture produced less in 1960 than had been produced in the pre-war years. Unrest was common, particularly among students and writers. The young Slovak Alexander Dubček came to power in January 1968. People did not expect very much from him. Yet, in the effort of reform in Czechoslovakia, Dubček was aided by public opinion, which was growing stronger by the day. By April 1968, the old regime had crumbled and reformers held sway, adopting the so-called action programme that month. This programme encompassed not only economic reform, but also widespread democratisation of Czechoslovakia. Among its most important points were the promotion of Slovakia to full equality, industrial and agricultural reform, a revised constitution, and a com complete rehabilitation of all citizens whose rights had been infringed in the past. International opinion saw Dubček as offering socialism with a human face. The effect of the liberalisation movement, which became known as the Prague Spring, on the Czechoslovak public was intense. Alternative forms of political organisation quickly emerged. There were even efforts to re-establish the Social Democratic Party, which had been fused with the Communists in 1948. Youth clubs and the Boy Scouts were resurrected, 
Christian churches, national minorities, human rights groups and other long forgotten societies became active as well. In June, the 2000 word manifesto, signed by thousands, urged mass action to demand real democracy. Though shocked, Dubček was convinced that he could control this transformation in Czechoslovakia. The Soviet Union was far more alarmed. After Dubček declined to participate in a special meeting of the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet Union sent him a letter in July saying that his country was on the verge of counter-revolution and that they considered it their own duty to protect it. On the evening of August 20th, Soviet-led armed forces invaded the country. The Soviet authorities seized Dubček and secretly took him to Moscow. His successor, Hushak, declared the Prague Spring to be finished and promptly initiated a process of so-called normalization. Socialist Yugoslavia was formed in 1946 after Joseph Tito and his communist-led partisans liberated the country from German rule. The communist government split with the Soviet Union in 1948, with Tito refusing to let the Soviets boss him around and developing closer ties with the West. Yugoslavia remained a socialist country, but one that listened to consumer demand and the free market. Remarkable growth was achieved in the 50s and 60s, but development subsequently slowed. Workers' councils were established to speak for labourers, but they often raised wage levels above the true earning capacity of their organisations, a system influenced by corruption and causing serious inflation. Tito performed better in foreign affairs, where he became the darling of the West for standing up to the Soviets. Meanwhile, the various nationalities of Yugoslavia were encouraged to love and respect each other. However, the system was only kept in place by the military, secret police and the presence of Tito himself. When the great man died in 1980, Yugoslavia's future appeared increasingly unclear. To conclude, it is incorrect to think of Eastern Europe during the Cold War as a solely grey and repressive place. Serious attempts at reform were initiated. These attempts, however, had their limits, limits set in place by Soviet tanks. In the end, most communist leaders sought to bribe their population with increased consumer good production, but this involved taking out giant loans from the West. When these loans were called in the 1980s, the whole system began to break down.